Interesting name for the man we're going to talk about here, but we'll give you what he's most, most well known by, and, and his name is uh, Uncle John Vassar. Uncle John Vassar, V-A-S-S-A-R. And uh, can't, uh, can't recommend enough this book um, called The Fight of Faith, uh, The Life of Uncle John Vassar, and uh, actually Bethel. In, uh, in London, uh, Ontario, is um, reprinted this, I believe. Um, originally published by the American Baptist Publication Society in Philadelphia. Um, <clears throat> it's a biography uh, by his nephew, T.E. Vassar, and the introduction that's given is by A.J. Gordon. Lord willing, we'll talk about the life of A.J. Gordon longtime Baptist pastor in Boston, uh, Massachusetts. He wrote the introduction to the life of um, Uncle John Vassar. So this book is, it's about 200 pages uh, long. And um, when it was written originally, there are some uh, comments about this book and the life of this man. One, uh, <clears throat> Christian magazine said, we believe that the volume is destined to carry on the good work which its subject began. The Sunday School Times said, if one wants to know how to be wholly, or completely the Lord's, how to live for Him, to talk about Him, to think of Him, to commune with Him all the time, and yet without any appearance of cant or any lack of naturalness, let him by all means read Uncle John Vassar, The Fight of Faith. Another man said, in my opinion, it is one of the most inspiring and soul-quickening biographies which this country has produced in many a year. It will be an inspiration to many a pastor and to many a prayer meeting. There ought to be 50,000 copies of this book circulated. Um, another one said this, It is difficult to lay down this biography until one reaches the last page. It is full of the love of Christ and the love of souls. The Baptist teacher magazine said, the best of all ways to raise up men such as Uncle John is by the widespread circulation of his life, the reading of which can scarcely fail to quicken the most sluggish Christian pulse to a quicker, healthier beat. Charles Spurgeon said this, few books which have crossed the Atlantic will command a larger number of grateful and admiring readers than that which sets forth the life of Uncle John Vassar. Another book, another magazine says, John Vassar is portrayed vividly. One can almost see him. Yet he is nowhere a hero in himself. Between the lines, one sees the master that he served. A painter may exhaust his art upon the glory of the clouds at sunset, yet every stroke of his brush reveals the glory of the sun and honors it more than it does the cloud. And it goes on. That's just a few. And all these uh, other... Um, Things were st st stated about the book. Every student in every theological seminary in the land should have a copy. Every pastor in the land would be quickened by its perusal, um, etc. And it, of course, went out of print. Uh, the Illustrated Christian Weekly said, No Christian man or woman can afford not to read it. And... Uh, Spurgeon says this in, the, in his magazine, The Sword and the Trowel. In every special mission he, John Vassar, undertook, Uncle John more than justified the designation by which he was known the shepherd's dog. There was a reflex influence attending his labors. If, as the shepherd's dog, he went forth and brought home the wandering sheep, the pastors were stirred up to care for them in the fold. If he endeavored to raise churches to a higher spirituality, he left them with a quickened desire, the fixed resolution to copy an example so Christ-like. Billy Sunday said this, John Vassar was one of the greatest personal workers of the 19th century. He never preached a sermon that, but that he did personal work. He was a wonder. So um, I recommend you Listen for the next 20 minutes, but I recommend that you get that book and, and, uh, and read it. So Uncle John Vassar, born 1813, died 1878, and he was known, characterized by his passionate evangelism. He was a devoted soul winner 
and uh, he would never say this, but those that he worked with would say he was, he was maybe the greatest personal soul winner of modern times. He was never formally ordained to the ministry. He wasn't a pastor. Technically, he wasn't an evangelist. He never called himself either one. He never called himself a preacher. Never called himself an evangelist. Age, Pastor A.J. Gordon, who worked closely with or, uh, Uncle John Vassar, said this, He sought only the glory of God and the salvation of souls. He had a very direct and immediate method of evangelism. He would approach people, he would get the topic on the Lord, and then he would reason with them through their, through their arguments and through their uh, places of doubt. He would, he would reason with them. And uh, <clears throat> his intimate, fervent, personal devotion life in prayer was the secret of his success. So he was far more than just someone in the public eye. It was his personal prayer, secret of his success. Henry Durant, you ever heard of that name? I hadn't. But Henry Durant said this, I would rather have him in my home than the king or a king. So I looked up Henry Durant and we'll pass this around. And uh, this will tell us who Henry Durant is. <laughs> Here's a quote about him. The language of earth was foreign speech. The language of heaven was his mother tongue. The language of earth was foreign speech. The language of, of heaven was his mother tongue. And Henry Durant said, I'd rather spend time, I'd rather have this man in my house than the king. Henry Durant, it's coming around, <laughs> was the founding president of the University of California, today known as Cal, located in the wonderful conservative city of Berkeley, California, probably the epicenter of liberalism in America is the University of California, Berkeley. Henry Durant, however, was the founding uh, uh, president of that university. What about Henry Durant? Well, he attended Phillips Academy and then later Andover Theological Seminary. Is that name ringing a bell now? We're seeing that come up more and more through the uh, uh, men that went there. Andover, the pre founding president of the University of California went to Andover Theological Seminary. Uh, soon after, Judson and Rice and these men went there. Graduated uh, later from Yale in 1827. He was a congregational pastor. And uh, he was in the ministry for 16 years as a pastor. And after that time, he became the headmaster of what is now the Governor's Academy till 52. He goes in 53 to California, third paragraph, founds a private school for boys, which in 1855 was chartered as the College of California, which merged in 1868 into the University of California. Durant was elected the first president in 1870. And... Uh, after two years, he, he resigned, and uh, he was up in years. He resigned after two years. He was nearing 70. And um, then the year after he resigned, University of California moved to its now Berkeley campus. But after he resigned, he got the itch for political office, apparently. And so he was ran for an elected mayor of Oakland and uh, served there for three years, died in office in 1875. A man of great influence. Henry Durant said, I would rather have Uncle John Vassar in my home than the king. Vassar was saved at the age of 28 in Poughkeepsie, New York, 
had a revival and immediately began a lifelong um, commitment to Bible memory. Heard about Bible memory last week, right? He began a lifelong commitment to Bible memory. He wanted the Bible in his mind when he was in conversation uh, with people. He also faced personal tragedy <clears throat> as um, by 1847, at the age of 34, two of his children had passed away, and then at the age of 35, his wife died. So <clears throat> he serves in the church for uh, eight or nine years, at which time he was commissioned to do coal portage work, C-O-L-E, P-O-R-T-A-G-E, coal portage. He was a coal porter, which meant he was a door-to-door -door book salesman. And in this, these days, often that was religious books, Bibles and other, other books. And uh, he would go door-to-door -door distributing tracts and Bibles. And as a coal porter, he worked in various parts of the country. From 1850 to 1852, he worked in northern Illinois. Door to door, selling books, distributing tracts, witnessing. And it is said that many of his personal contacts, once he talked with someone for a while about their soul, ended up with Uncle John Vassar shedding tears for their soul. It's estimated that he visited, on average, <clears throat> 40 families per day. Often these meetings would be set up after men had come home from work and many of these meetings were done late into the evening just for the sake of being able to talk to the people while they were home. In one month period, um, uh, well, that's, he, he uh, was able to, to speak to um, 3,000 people personally about Christ. Not a pastor, not an evangelist. He remarries after his time here in northern Illinois and returns to New York. He uh, begins to do work with the temperance movement. Okay, The temperance movement, let's get the alcohol out of New York City. Let's get it out of these cities. It's tearing apart lives. And he saw, I'm sure, from going door to door in and through the cities, what alcohol does. Have you done that when you've been door to door in the cities working with people? Have you seen what a shame it is? How many times have you said, stop going down and throwing your money away on that alcohol and those cigarettes, and, 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 and you are wasting your money, you're wasting your life, right? Surely he saw the same thing and knew what it was doing to homes, knew that uh, women and children were going without money because dad was taking his paycheck and going down and giving it to the, to the, to the liquor crowd. He hated the liquor crowd. He knew what they were doing. They're profiting from the turmoil of the women and children that he saw when he was in their houses witnessing to them. He saw men too drunk to listen to him. <clears throat> well, uh, you can see from the time that he was born here, which was in uh, 1813, midlife for him is what big event in America? Was he got into his uh, 40s, 50s, what's happening in America, Civil War. And so he worked in the Civil War. He worked with tracks in the Civil War, witnessing, it is said, to 75 to 100 men per day, seven days a week, 16 to 18 hours a day. He was up, he was awake, he was witnessing to these men. Many, he figured, wouldn't be there the next day. They'd be dead. And uh, Christ in the Camp is another good book talking about what happened in the camps during the Civil War and the fact that uh, th there were revivals among many of the Civil War camps. And, and again, <laughs> when death is at <laughs> a day away and when you've already lost so many, and uh, death's facing you on the other side of that battlefield. He took advantage of that and witnessed throughout the, the, the troops uh, there. And um, he ends up 
at the first African church in Richmond at the end of the war. First African church in Richmond. And his personal work netted 500 converts added to the membership of the first African church in, in Richmond. In 1871, he returns to New England and he works in western Massachusetts, Otis, Massachusetts. And uh, his time of door-to-door tracts, Bibles, witnessing, uh, saw 50 people saved, baptized, and joining the Baptist church in, in Otis, Massachusetts. While in Massachusetts, he begins to work with uh, Pastor A.J. Gordon, who wrote the introduction here to this book. A.J. Gordon said, To one who never met him, it would be impossible to describe the impression which he instantly made on meeting him. He gave one literally a powerful electric shock the moment he touched him. There was an intensity of zeal accompanied by such a magnetic matter that the impression was instantaneous and quite overwhelming. It was the lightning-like penetration of a piety that was always charged to the highest pitch. It, the first question that occurred to me, how could it be possible for a man to live in such a tense and high-wrought condition of religious fervor? Yet there was little variation to his spiritual temperature. He traveled from Maine to Florida, from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific, on foot, on horseback, by rail, by steamer, resting not in summer or in a harsh winter, in the one intense, eager pursuit of lost souls. Wherever you found him, there was the same burning zeal speaking out in his looks and in his words. That is one small part of a very lengthy introduction given by A.J. Gordon about his life. It is um, 16 pages of this book written uh, there about uh, the life of, um, of Uncle John Vassar. A.J. Gordon, his church was stimulated by Uncle John Vassar to evangelism. A.J. Gordon took over a Baptist church in Boston that was dead and he had to very patiently change some of the dead orthodoxy of this Baptist church through, through several years. And we're going to, again, Lord willing, we'll have time to get to his life and we'll find a pastor who took over a work and had to wisely take his time changing things and, and, and convincing people step by step of, of uh, things that they had let slip, e even some very basic things we would think, some obvious things, but he stuck with them. And um, one big boost to his church to stir them up to evangelism was when Uncle John Vassar came and what he did. Uh, the church was an evangelistic outreach ministry after this layman came and spent time there at that church. John Vassar was no respecter of persons. He would work with the lowest of the low. Uh, and he would witness to the people of tr great uh, uh, wealth and influence. The last three to four years of his life, his health got uh, worse. Um, and um, he um, passed away uh, December 6th, 1878, and is known as the most useful layman, and again, layman, I know we use that term. It's really not a Bible term. It's really kind of a term that came about when the Catholic Church divided people into clergy or laity. Uh, maybe a better term than layman is church members. Uh, that'd be a better way to, to term that. But the most useful church member, non-pastor, non-ordained man of his age, and again, you'll get your fill uh, here reading uh, this book. And um, uh, he um, stirred the lives of people uh, that, he, uh, that, that he saw. Baptist Weekly it is one of the most charming biographies we have ever read. It is an eloquent argument from his consecrated life for a deeper experience in religion, for a greater fellowship with Christ, and for greater Christian activity.
So I hope that this brief lecture is not the end of your study of uh, John Vassar and his life, uh, and I hope that what he did ch challenge you. Forget the title. Forget your title. Forget whatever, you know, staff member, Pat, forget that. He never had that, and yet his work uh, far exceeded um, what many people uh, did in their, in their lives.